Jacksonville's joint hurricane exercise centered around a category one storm called Astro. The storm caused significant flooding both inland and at the beaches, as well as significant sustained wind damage both inland and along the coast. The exercise is, is very important, but it's not just this exercise. We prepare every day of the year, and we have our folks out there that deal with emergencies every day. And those are, those are the blue sky emergencies, and so we're preparing for the gray sky emergencies. So it's always good to be prepared. But no, we're, we are not worried at all because we stay ready. The three-day exercise is a chance to practice the Incident Command System, or ICS. It was held at JEA's new Emergency Operations Center. This operations center is located at CoLogix, which is off of Spring Park Road. This facility would be activated in that we have a large-scale emergency or hazard, and the size of the incident has expanded beyond the local control. So our emergency preparedness team would, would contact everyone on our incident management team. They'd all come here, and it would help us coordinate our operations in response to the event. Also this year, representatives from an outside utility attended the exercise. Senior leaders from Austin Energy, a utility that often helps JA with mutual aid during restoration, came to see ICS in action. I think with extreme weather happening across the country, and especially in Central Texas, we're experiencing different weather patterns than we have in the past. And recently in February, we had a very bad ice storm that caused a long duration outage. One thing we realized from that was that we need to expand our emergency operations preparedness. And so we're visiting peer utilities who have other significant experience to just learn best practices, observe how the exercises go, how you train people up, how you organize your incident command. Representatives from the National Weather Service told attendees this is an El Nino year, which could mean fewer hurricanes. But they added, don't let that fool you. When Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida in late August of 1992, it too was in an El Nino year. I'd say respect. Opportunity. Community. Because we as JE employees are a community and we also are a part of a larger community, the Jacksonville community. Enlightening, very enlightening. 100% community. I would say innovative. One thing I learned in my early days at JA is definitely ask questions if you don't know, especially working at NGS, you know, you were always in a dangerous environment. And there's a lot of things that you, you, you will not know just because you're an intern and you just don't know everything, right? Of course, 100% I would, because I really enjoyed my summers here. And I actually was able to return for three years. I was a co-op for three years. And every summer I learned something new. I was able to do something different. When you're a co-op at JEA, you're working with the best of the best. You know, JEA is big on hiring the best of the best people to do the best of the best jobs. And when you work here as an intern, you're among those people, you learn from those people. Those people are very open to teaching you and molding you and guiding you. So, you know, if, if you want to advance your career, then you have to start off with, you have to start off around those people and in that type of environment. So I think JEA is that place. Fantastic presentations. Um, I'm in Colorado, um, but I am um, in video and wanted to call the meeting to order um, and would like Vice Chairman uh, Lanahan to do the public comments if she's willing to do that. Um, and at this time, like to have a time of reflection. Adoption of the agenda. So moved. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Raven Simmons, um, can you walk through the values moment? Absolutely, thank you. Good morning, Chair Stein, board members. My name again is Raven Simmons. I'm a senior talent acquisition specialist here at JEA. Uh, in addition to being on the recruitment team, I also get the wonderful opportunity to work with and manage uh, the program uh, for our co-ops and high school interns, our college co-ops and interns. Uh, today's value moment is gonna be centered around respect, specifically self-respect and integrity. Uh, these are a few traits that were woven into me as a young woman or at, at a very young age. So as a young girl, my stepfather, who was wheelchair bound and was our domestic engineer, and for some of you that don't or aren't familiar with that job title, that is the individual that is the stay at home parent. So my stepfather was our domestic engineer. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time with me uh, on my vocabulary words, my sight words. Uh, so much so that I won the um, spelling bee for my elementary school and went on to represent us on the district level. Uh, so funny fact about, funny and hidden fact about Raven is that I still have some family members that will call me in this age of Google and ask me how to spell something. <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but that's okay. So fast forward to high school, a cooperative was uh, created between my local chamber of commerce um, the school district in which I attended, and uh, community businesses. Representatives came to our classroom several times, several times, each week, each week, and they always asked for males. And so one time I just I asked the question, well, when can, fe what about females? And so the following week they came back and opened up the opportunity to females. Um, our received all of the letters of recommendations that I needed to join the program and was offered an opportunity at a local company. The individuals at the company, as well as the chamber, shared with me that they'd offered the opportunity to me because of how I'd conducted myself in the interview process. I like to think that from my early days with my stepfather helping me with my vocabulary, building confidence in me, instilling in me self-respect, respect in general, and integrity, and how to appropriately conduct myself were some of the traits that actually, that they were able to see in making that decision. So I leave you all with this one Dr. Seuss quote. So Dr. Seuss says, uh, so be sure when you step, step with care and great tact. And remember that life's a great balancing act. But to be more specific with that stepping with care and great tact, I challenge you to have uh, respect, self-respect, and integrity included in that. So that's my value moment. Thank you. Raven, that's touching, impressive. Um, at this point, uh, give councilman uh, Bolin, a chance to give his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Tonight marks the end of the current class of city council. We've got an unprecedented number of new council members coming on board in July. I believe it's 12. And so my message today is to encourage both the management and the board to take the time and effort to, to get to know and communicate the message of JEA to this, these groups. They, they are good folks who are well-intended in what they do, but they're novices in the process. And as they see the board coming forward and sharing information about what's going on, I think it's gonna be very helpful as we get into the budget season. So I, I, I would encourage that. Uh, we have not yet had a council, vice, a council president elect. Salem has not yet made com committee assignments, but I am hopeful I'm gonna be able to continue to serve as the liaison for JEA. Thank you. Thank you, council member, and I appreciate all you're doing for us in our community. Um, at this time, I would like to ask if we have any comments from the public. Um, and with that, um, public comments related to the public hearing will be held at later in today's meeting. But at this time, I'll hand um, those comments over to uh, Vice Chairman Lanahan. Um, we do have one card filed. Um, Josh Milku. And Josh, I'm sorry if I did not say your last name properly. That's quite all right. Thank you. I'm Josh Melko from the University of North Florida, associate professor. 
Uh, and with the budget uh, before you today, I just had one quick sort of comment uh, about the budget. I really appreciate uh, the material, the breakdown, especially the little dollar graphic where we can see as customers where all of our money goes. Um, but one sort of additional question, and, and maybe this is already available or maybe it's already um, sort of a, a provision that the, the board requires, but I'm wondering how much of a customer's bill goes to say political uh, activities, you know, whether that's fighting off privatization, which I think the general public really supports and would like that money, oh, would like that money uh, used. Better? Would like that money used for those sorts of efforts or trade association dues, like the American Public Power Association, which was largely responsible for direct pay provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that JEA can use to own and build their own solar. These are really good things. But I think there should be transparency there for the general public, how much, well, it's probably pennies or less of each bill is going to these sorts of uh, activities. You know, with a new mayor, a new city council coming in, I think it's good for everybody to work together, but also in an effort of transparency to allow the public to see uh, how their money is being spent. So uh, the board could, of course, you know, require um, publish of disclosures detailing any of these sort of political influences or provide them as line items uh, in the budget, perhaps in future years. Thank you. Thank you. We'll invite you to our next finance committee meeting where we talk about those things. <laughs> Is there anybody else? Well, is anybody on the phone, Logan? Or on the email? Nope. Okay. All right. Nobody else? Um, Jay, then we'll pass it to you, and then Bobby will pass it back to you. Thank okay. you, Marty. Thank you very much, and good morning, um, everyone. Uh, appreciate you being here first uh, day of summer. Uh, you could tell by the heat that we had uh, yesterday. So we're glad that um, everyone is here and Chair Stein's able to join us uh, virtually. Um, it is uh, not, it's not normal and typical that we have a, um, a celebrity in our midst, but Art Graham is the, our PSC uh, representative and Art uh, is, is here, former council member and been on the PSC for 13 years. The Public Service Commission in Florida um, does not have direct um, oversight of what we do with rates, but they do approve our rate structures. We do work with them on our 10-year site plan. We do work with them on need for power. We work with them on siting of generation. Uh, and so we have, we, we submit information on our reliability and there's a lot of interactions that we have um, with the PSC. So we appreciate you being here to see what's going on uh, here in Jacksonville and JEA. Thank you. Um, I also I had uh, planned at the end of, of my remarks to recognize the new administration and the council, um, but since you mentioned that, I, I want to say that we are looking forward to um, continuing uh, the work that we have with the city, uh, the work with the new administration, and, and the work with the council members, both the new council members and the returning council members. So thank you for bringing that up as we, trans we go through this transition um, period. I also um, had um, when I started this, uh, I was planning on having a short um, summary and it turned into not a short summary. Uh, and so um, I want to cover, where well, there's a lot of things going on, I want to cover as much of them as we can. Um, first off on long-term long workforce planning, it's one of our top strategic objectives. And our mission is to actively engage in recruitment processes that can attract and retain the most qualified candidates. We, we want to be focused on the diversity of our communities that we serve. In March, we addressed our talent inventory process, discussed challenges, reviewed our outlook with our workforce and customer committee. Over the last five or six months, uh, we've started a, a more focused group within the organization called Organizational Effects, Effectiveness that's inside the strategy team. And that we will build on the work that we've had for a number of years, improving ta talent planning, in general, but it's in particularly important because we have uh, up to a little over 30% of our employees that will be eligible to retire between now and 2030. And we need to be able to be intentional about our long-term workforce planning. We have a lot of strategies that we're working through, looking at job profiles, what employees currently do, what they want to do, so session planning down through the manager level, employee development and updating our general processes and procedures. 
So we'll keep on reviewing that as we work forward, move forward with the, the workforce and customer committee and a lot, a lot of additional work needs to be completed in FY24. This will also include a broader look at benchmarks uh, to look at how we compare not only in the people side of our business, but in all facets of the work that we do to ensure we're being as effective as we can uh, as we move forward and plan for the future. Speaking of the future, uh, it's been a long-standing tradition for JAA to partner with colleges and universities in the area and the region to bring in summer co-ops. Uh, we have a number of employees that started with us as co-ops. And, and right before the meeting, I verified this date was correct, but Ricky Erickson, our Vice President of Electric Systems, was a co-op in the summer of 1989. So if those of you, the co-ops that are in the room, if you want to track down Ricky and find out all the things that he did uh, through his career, you can uh, do that. This summer, we're joined by 26 college uh, interns and co-ops. Some of them are returning. Um, the students represent several universities across our, our region, and they're working in technology, accounting, engineering, marketing, GIS, strategy, the environmental area, and human resources. We also have seven high school students from Creekside High School who are focusing on the environmental areas and engineering. And I'd like to thank the JEA team members that are helping to mentor and support this group of, of people. Um, Raven, I appreciate you doing the, the values moment. Raven is the senior talent acquisition specialist for, she's managing this program for the co-ops. So liaison to the rest of JEA to help support this. Um, and I appreciate the work you've done to help revamp the program and make it even stronger than it has been in years uh, past. Yeah, thank you. And to the co-ops, I think this is a fantastic, there's several of them online and in the, in the audience today. I think this is a great opportunity for you to learn and grow and have an impact, uh, not just on JEA, but the overall community. So pay attention to the things around you and soak up all the knowledge and experience you can. You'll learn things here, whether you know it or not, you'll learn things here that will last a lifetime. We work hard to treat each other with courtesy and respect in everything that we do, and I hope you see that in every interaction. I also would encourage you to tell us things that we might be able to do differently because we are, as a utility, sometimes the utility industry is a little slow to change and you might see things that we don't see because we've been doing it for so long. So feel free to speak up um, and let us know what we might be able to do better. As you learn from us, I hope, I know we will learn from you. So if, you, if the co-ops would stand up and we'll recognize you, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you very much. So during the 2023 Florida legislative, legislative session, which is harder to say than uh, it should be, um, a new law was enacted that changes some key aspects of how uh, unions uh, operate. While many union organizations have filed in court to try to stop the bill, right now it will go into effect as of July 1st. And the biggest impact on how JEA and our five unions operate is that payroll deduction for union dues will need to be uh, stopped. The automatic payroll deduction will stop. And, and um, the unions are still operating as they always have, supporting 1,300 or so of our uh, valuable workforce. I think that's 1,600 of our valuable workforce. Um, and we'll continue to partner with them closely, but it does change the way this operates a little bit. Um, and I wanna be sure we're aware of that. And finally, on the workforce and the people side, between the last meeting and this meeting, I had the chance to go to the American Water Works Association Conference in Toronto, where we had three teams competing in the operations challenge. We met them a couple of meetings ago. I was proud of the way that they represented us, worked at a team, and I think that will help us be better not just in the event that they were participating in, but in everything we do. You saw on the video uh, earlier that we had our hurricane uh, exercise in our new uh, emergency operations center. Uh, and it is in place for us to be sure that we serve the community well. We remain ready, not just for storms, but we use that area for other incidents. Um, and there are quite frankly, emergencies every day that our crews respond to. Because the services we provide are foundational to the community, it's important that we not work in a silo. And so during our exercise, we worked with not just the JEA team, but the city of Jacksonville, including the fire and rescue, 
the Emergency Preparedness Division. Um, one of our primary mutual aid utilities, Austin Energy, had three senior leaders come to join in and observe the exercise so we could continue to, to learn from each other. I think the General DeSalvo visited uh, the operations, the Emergency Operations Center a few weeks ago, and we're trying to set up some uh, tours for some of the rest of you. If you're interested in that, uh, talk to Melissa and we can get that um, set up. So thank you for going to see that. Thank you. We also, as I said, um, Austin Energy from Texas was there with us during the exercise. We have this long relationship with Austin just to do mutual aid. We've shared crews back and forth, but we also do mutual aid in other areas. And on June 15th, we had 38 team members head out from JEA to Tallahassee to assist with some restoration efforts during a severe storm that left thousands without power. Um, we think this is an important part of being community owned um, and what being a community owned utility is all about. So we were able to help, help them. Each year, we work hard to compile operation and financial information so that we can talk to the three independent financial rating agencies. And recently we learned that Fitch Ratings has upgraded JEA's revenue bonds from AA to AA plus for our water and wastewater system and district energy bonds. Separately, Fitch affirmed JEA's AA ratings on our electric system revenue, which is important because all of that helps to lower borrowing costs and translates to lower costs to our customers. Part of what the rating agencies look at is at the stability of our long-term plans. Later today, you'll consider a part of the consent agenda, a solar power project, we're working with the Florida Municipal Power Association to add to our clean energy portfolio. This helps us to continue the path we set with our goals from the electric integrated resource plan to get to 35% clean energy by 2030. The next big steps of the implementation of the IRP are to comp complete a transmission study and a siting study for a potential natural gas combined cycle plant. Both of these studies are underway in the next few months. We'll have more information to present to make the best decisions that we can. Additionally, we discussed at the IRP uh, meet about the IRP at the last meeting uh, that we needed to develop some more definitive plans for our longer term commitments. And while we're not planning on making specific targets for the longer term, we are working on some ideas for you to consider in the coming months to be sure the community understands our longer term commitment to affordable, reliable, and sustainable generation for the long term. Later today, we'll also hear from Paul Mitchell, Vice President of Economic Development, uh, in a public hearing uh, where he will review the enhanced economic development programs and will request the board to take action at its next meeting uh, to approve those uh, enhanced rate, uh, those enhanced rate products to support economic develop development. As we focus on improving lives and building community, it's critical that JEA stays actively involved in economic development in our community. We're part of a partnership with Jax USA, the city of Jacksonville, the, and the state of Florida to work to encourage economic development in Northeast Florida and to support our key customers for job and investment growth. And since the, over the last several months, maybe over the last year, our team has been working with others and on May 23rd, the Jacksonville City Council approved a 330 acre land sale and incentives package for the Constantino Group. It's a global sustainable surf surfaces company, counters, countertops. The uh, legislation approved included paying JEA two and a half million dollars to make sewer and water infrastructure improvements. And we will be putting dollars into the water and sewer infrastructure to encourage that development and future development in the Cecil Commerce Center and it's a sign of the partnership that I think we have with the city and Jack's USA and others to support economic development in the area. Quick update on the headquarters. We've been for a while giving you updates on this building. Um, and now that we are in it and into a routine, um, we now are focused on what to do with the old HQ building. Um, so we're continuing to clean out that building and get it ready. We've, um, we've been able to help uh, city of Jacksonville and some other non and some, and some nonprofit organizations to use some of the furniture that we had in there. And we've brought on CBRE as our broker representative to help market and provide consulting services as we try to look for ways to transition that property to future beneficial use. We've had a kickoff meeting with CBRE and they are working through 
options uh, to figure out what might be the best use of that site. CB CBRE is also supporting us in deciding how to market and develop the St. John's River Power Park. This site's one of the largest sites of its kind on the East Coast, maybe in the country, and has significant value as an economic development site that will help support Northeast Florida and the broader region for years to come. We're making sure we make good decisions on this project and we'll bring more information to you as we discuss our options. I thought that today was going to be the day that we were going to talk to you about how Plant Vogel was online. And I thought it so much that we took it out of the agenda package as its own agenda item. And it turns out we should have left it in as its own agenda item because it is not online. Um, it is. There are um, two or three problems that they are working through that they've announced a, a delay. Uh, and I, I don't, they've given a, a potential date, but I'm, we're still going to keep on watching that. It's another month away uh, before uh, we expect that to come online. Uh, the team is working as hard as they can to get things, but they keep on running into problems. And um, this, is, this is significantly better for all involved for them to find the issues before we turn it on. And so um, it's they're continuing to make progress on that. And then finally today, I'd like to note the passing of Northside Coalition founder ben, ben Frazier, a leading community activist and frequent commenter at public meetings, including JEA board meetings. He supported our community with a dedication and passion and on behalf of JEA and the team members here, want to extend condolences to his family, his loved ones, and to the community for the loss. Thank you all for being here. It's an important meeting with the, um, with the budget um, being considered, um, and we appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Jay, thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to recess the regular board of directors meeting and call the public hearing to order. Uh, call upon Paul Mitchell, Vice President of Economic Development, um, to walk through the public hearing. Thank you, Chair Stein, board members. Good morning. Paul Mitchell with Economic Development, and I'm, I'm excited to update you on a couple of items related to our economic development programs. As an economic development driver in Northeast Florida, JEA is committed to help lead and support the region's growth initiatives by focusing on site readiness or to assess and invest in utility infrastructure to enhance, to enhance key sites and assets, downtown revitalization, to support and partner with the city of Jacksonville to enhance downtown revitalization plans, and to refresh our economic development incentives. This all drives economic growth and additional companies that increase tax base, capital investment, and new jobs in Northeast Florida, thus contributing to our mission to improve lives and build a community. At the April 25th board meeting, I presented desired changes to the current EDP as well as a second tier to that rider we are calling the enhanced EDP. As you can see from the slide, two different programs. The purpose of the program is to encourage growth and attract expansion by providing lower cost of energy. As a reminder, to qualify for the program, a business must on, on the first, the left hand, the current EDP, excuse me, uh, the company must bring 300 kilowatts of demand and commit to creating 15 new jobs. The discount is provided for six years and starting at 30%, decreasing by 5% over the life of the program. There are two primary changes that we are proposing for the current EDP. One is to remove the term experimental from the title of the program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Secondly, we would like to adopt a 5% bonus to the discount schedule for projects located in target areas, which are city designated distressed areas or and industrial zoned properties as defined by the property appraiser website in all territories served by JEA. At this moment, 18 companies have EDP agreements in place. 
while we've had success with this program, we'd also like to propose an enhanced EDP or tier two for larger, more competitive economic development projects. The major qualifiers and provisions for this rider are as follows. This program would be nine years starting at 45%, decreasing by 5% per year for eight years. To qualify, a business must bring 500 kilowatts of new demand and create at least, at least 50 jobs. Or if a project brings 3,000 kilowatts of demand and creates 15 new jobs, this project would also qualify. For this rider, we are proposing that the project be in one of Florida's targeted industries, which, is, which are identified by the state of Florida, city of Jacksonville, Economic, Office of Economic Development, and JAX USA. And they are, the industries are ma manufacturing, defense aerospace, life sciences, logistics distribution, IT, financial and business services, and headquarters projects. These industries pay higher wages and typically require a great amount of capital investment. Lastly, we would in also include the 5% bonus for this program as well. Of the 18 clients, ED, sorry, the 18 EDP clients, five of those projects would qualify for this new enhanced program. The changes and enhancements to the tariff will not impact any existing customers and will be presented to the board for approval at JEA's next board meeting on August 29th, 2023. Thank you, Chair Stein. This concludes the presentation portion of the public hearing, and I'm happy to address any questions. Do we have any comments from the public regarding the economic development program rider in person or online? Landon? For those that have joined us online, if you would like to be recognized for public comments, go ahead and use your raised hand feature or um, submit something in the chat window within WebEx. There's nobody in the audience uh, in person. And there is no one. Um, Nothing has been received via chat, and there is no raised hands alternative. <laughs> this item will come before the board at the August 29th meeting for action. Seeing that there is no other business, the public hearing is adjourned, and the regular JEA board of directors meeting is reconvened and called to order. At this point, um, I'd like to go to JEA performance update. Jay. Good morning, Chair Stein and board members. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all this morning. My name is Jay McGee, and I'm proud to represent the digital communications team here at JEA as its director. I have been with JEA as a team member for just over five years and as a customer for 26 years. Chances are, if you've ever visited JEA.com, liked or commented on a JEA social media post, gotten an email asking you to conserve water, or sign up for one of our billing and payment programs, you've experienced the work and talent of JEA's digital communications team. Our department of nine oversees content and the user experience for JEA's owned and shared digital communication channels. And I mean, JEA.com, social media, email marketing, customer alerts, and internal communications. Our charge is to ensure customers have a positive interaction when they knock on our proverbial digital door to pay their bill, report an outage, research rebate programs, ask for support, and so on, all the while keeping a firm eye focused on what's next in technology so as to keep up with our customers' expectations. And to that end, we have several upgrades in the pipeline, principally the launch of our first ever customer mobile app, which we'll unveil later this year. We're also focused on improving the internal team member experience and increasing employee engagement by effectively communicating through new tools to help us reach our highly distributed workforce, including an employee app and reimagined internet experience. It's an honor to present to you today our June performance update, and this includes data through May 31st, 2023. For this month's update, we're pleased to report that we're seeing both stability and positive trending in our scorecard metrics, which is a good indication of continued strong performance as we get closer to the fourth quarter in a few short days. As we've now officially entered into the summer months, although you might not know it judging by this past week's wet weather, 
we've seen the effects of spring's overall dry weather conditions on grid water pressure. In April and May, we had spikes in the average minutes of water pressure less than 30 PSIs. With these conditions driving customers to irrigate more often, we're continuing to monitor flows by using pressure controls and working with our communications teams to share with customers the need for conservation. The fuel forecast decreased by 1 million from last month. The primary drivers in the month over month change includes lower north side solid fuel prices and natural gas prices, offset by higher than forecasted May expense and maintenance on Brandy Branch combined cycle. The effect of the lower fuel forecast has on revenue is, however, being partially offset by a forecasted increase in water, sewer, and reclaim sales. While data through May 31st indicates a projected pay for performance payout at 4.25% of base salaries, recent activity around customer satisfaction has lowered the projected payout to 3.25%. We look forward to discussing recent JD Power survey results and associated drivers at our next board meeting. While this concludes this monthly performance update, our team is happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Jake, thank you for your presentation. Um, at this point, hand it to General DeSalvo for the Finance and Operations Committee report. Great, thanks Chair Stein. The Finance and Operations Committee met last Friday on 23 June. I was joined by fellow committee members, Marty Lenahan and Rick Morales. I also like to thank John Baker for joining us online. The committee took action on a few agenda items, which will require the board to take action during the consent agenda. First one is a solar energy project with Florida Municipal Power a a Agency. The Electric Integrated Resource Plan recommends a significant increase in the amount of solar in the JEA portfolio, and JEA has a goal of 35% clean energy by 2030. The Florida Municipal Power Agency has negotiated a solar project with a developer at multiple sites for its members and has offered JEA solar resources from two sites for JEA's consideration. A power sales contract will need to be executed with FMPA and a transmission service agreement with Florida Power and Light. If approved, it is expected to start in December 2026 and will terminate after 20 years for an approximate total cost of $400.8 million. The price of energy and the associated renewable credits is approximately $306 million. And the current transmission costs to deliver energy from FMPA solar sites to JEA is roughly $94.4 million. As Jay said uh, earlier, this is an essential enabler for JEA to achieve the IRP renewable energy goal of 35% by 2030. The next action item is the Wild Light Agreement. JEA is working with Wild Light LLC to provide water, wastewater, or reclaimed water in a Nassau County development. Wild Light and JEA wish to enter into an agreement to provide services to the community. JEA will be cost participating in the construction of the transmission mains. Based on an agreement, JEA's max indebtedness is $160 million. Wild Light is providing the engineering, JEA is installing the mains. Each phase will go through JEA's procurement process. Next action item was a district energy system FY23 budget amendment. Staff is seeking board approval to amend the FY23 DES capital budget of $6.9 million with an increase of $2.9 million to a capital budget total of $9.8 million. This is due to five capital projects of about $2 million that were added to the plan, as well as three project budget increases in the amount of $800,000. And lastly, the FY24 budget. The committee reviewed the FY24 budget in great detail. Lori Whitmer, Director of Budgets, will provide a condensed presentation a little later in the meeting and request the board to take action. And additionally, the committee heard two other presentations not requiring action. First one was the interlocal agreements. JEA has three interlocal agreements with surrounding counties to provide water and wastewater services within Nassau, St. John's, and Clay counties. 
JEA was approached by the city of Atlantic Beach to conduct an analysis on their water utility. JEA has engaged a rate consultant to gather data and make a recommendation for the future. The committee will receive further updates as progress is made. And finally, we received a quarterly financial review. The good news story is that the projected rates are below 6% of what they were in March. Sales are up 3.1% year to date, and that is in line with a 2.9% increase in customer count. Overall, the metrics look strong. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any comments? Bobby, can I ask Jay a question? Absolutely. Um, it, it looks like the, we've committed um, to supply or, or to buy the solar stuff at a fixed price. And obviously we've got 160 million in the wildlife program. Did, does the finance committee or does any the board review these projects and, and can, are they financially good or bad to the JEA? Yes, we, there's, let me answer it, I think two different ways. Um, they are, the wildlife agreement is financially good because of the growth that comes on and the expenditure is a maximum indebtedness that won't happen until there are things happening within the development. So there's limited risk on, on that piece of it. On the, um, on the solar project, um, it becomes a, we've got the cost of what it will cost over the full life of the, the project. Um, and it will be part of the overall portfolio um, and part of our fuel costs that goes through our normal process. And so I think we're in good shape on that too, in order to reach those 35% um, clean energy goals. Both of those are safe. Now, that's the first answer. The second one is we should be able to report back to you on specific activities on projects like this to be sure that it's consistent with what we said it was going to be. So we'll find opportunities on a regular basis to update you and let you know where right. that stands. And we did discuss in the finance committee meeting that relative to the Florida Power and Light solar agreement that while that is an interim solution, this is why one of the reasons we're doing the IRP in another three years because that looks great towards our goals, but it, there's a finite period of time to which that contract is recognized, right? So that's why the IRP is so important because we've got to get some of our own generation in here for the longer term. And get rid of the transmission cost, that $100 million almost. Yes. Um, yes, transmission cost will be a part of the solution anyway, ongoing both internal and externally to our system. We'll have um ongoing transmission costs to be able to bring more um energy into the system and within our system so that's the study there's two studies i talked about um one of them is the transmission study to understand what that long-term cost is and yes that is one of the there's two different pro projects this fmpa is a 20-year um, power sales agreement uh, that uh, will get us through 20 years, it doesn't uh, preclude us from extending that if the if everything is working where it needs to be in 20 years. And that is part of the every three year update to the IRP plan. It's unlikely that we'll be here in 20 years, John, but we, we can't, <laughs> we, we can't declare victory for future, you know, boards, obviously. You might be here, I probably won't. <laughs> Marty, don't underestimate yourself. <laughs> Any other comments? Do we need a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval. Yes, I'm going to move to that next, but I just want to make sure on the finance and operations we have any other comments. Uh, on the consent agenda, can we have a motion? So move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, all's against the motion passes at this time um, have a presentation by Laura Whitmer deep in customer and community engagement plan for the future
So good morning, Chair Stein and board members. I'm Lori Whitmer, Director of Budgets. I'll be presenting the 24 budget for your review and approval. As mentioned last Friday, the 24 budget was reviewed by the Finance and Operations Committee. So today is an abridged version. Um, you can find the full material in the supplemental section of the board packet. Building our 24 budget, we do through the lens of our values, strategic focus areas, and strategic objectives. Here's how we are meeting our 24 financial objectives to align with our strategy. Taking a proactive approach to monitoring 24 O&M spending to achieve strategic objectives, increased headcount to support growing needs of the business, proactive rate adjustments are included to support the continued cost of doing business. Continuous assessment of non-fuel purchase power rate stabilization usage to offset increased costs associated with Vogel, growing of the district energy system, and stable financial metrics. The proposed 24 budget reflects prudent spending with strategy in mind. The capital plan contains projects that will support and grow the systems, always striving for effective completion. Fuel and purchase power forecasts are projected to decline to an average in the upper 30 per megawatt hour. The non-fuel purchase power includes $197.2 million in expenses for Vogel. A withdrawal of $15 million from the rate stabilization will slightly offset this expense. The 24 budget is intended to be supported by a mid-year base revenue increase of 3.75% on electric and stable water and DES rates. Here is our historical and consolidated operating budget of $1.954 billion that includes electric, water, and DES. The key driver for 24 being lower than 22 and 23 is due to lower fuel projections. Here's an illustration that breaks down electric, water, operating budget components into the dollar. So for every dollar the customer pays for electric and water services, this is where the money is going. O&M, fuel and purchase power, and current year capital funds are the three largest components. This slide breaks down the $1.329 billion budget into its operating components, the electric budget, operating budget. The largest component in 24 is fuel at $446 million, approximately one-third of the operating budget. This is a significant decrease compared to 22 and 23. The non-fuel purchase power is $245 million. This includes the withdrawal of $15 million from the stabilization fund. The O&M budget is $315 million, an increase of $20 million compared to 23 budget, and no new debt for 24. Here's an illustration that breaks down the electric operating budget components into the dollar. So for every dollar the customer pays for electric service, this is where the money is going. Fuel and purchase power is the largest expense. This slide breaks down the water operating budget of 613 million into the operating components. This is an increase of 9 million compared to 23. For 24, we have New money debt issuance forecasted at $352.6 million. The O&M budget, $236 million, is an increase of $31 million compared to 23. Here's an illustration that breaks down the water operating budget components into the dollar. So for every dollar for water services on the customer bill, this is where your money is going. The largest component is O&M. So we seek staff, seeks board approval for the 24 budget. Um, I would also like to take this time to thank the operating and capital budget teams for their hard work that they put this together. Um, I think they're a great team and I'm lucky to be working with each of them. Any comments from the board? Can I ask a question, Bobby? Absolutely. As I understand it, Jay, the non-fuel purchase power includes 
Vogel, and yeah. yet it is down year year over year. How does that happen? I'll let Lori dive into that one. <laughs> so in 22, you'll see that it was higher, um, and 23 is also higher because where any excess revenue from a year we're contributing in 22 and 23 to prepare for withdrawals 24 through 28. So we put some of the funds into that reserve fund so that we could um, not have to have such large rate increases. It, it smoothed the glide path uh, over the next several years is what made that. And if you look back into 21, that non-fuel purchase power was 65 million and now it's this year, 245 million. That was where we were building up the reserve fund for a number of years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The only, the only comment I have is the capital spend in 24 is a significant number. Do we have a thought of how this could be looked at, managed? Um, in past years, we've always, you know, had a bigger number, which was used to pay off debt, which is a great thing, but it'd just be better to have this thing closer to the budget to where we're really spending. So any thoughts there, Jay? Yeah, we are working with the team, both the, the planning team, engineering team, um, to get the construction um, on that so that we can be better able to meet that goal and that target. In the past several years, we have budgeted a number and we haven't been able to execute on the on the plan. Um, so Ray and her team in particular are looking at this and what we have in the budget now are things that we really think we need and we're working with the the long-term workforce plan to be sure that we have the right people in place to execute on the projects and that includes both consultants contractors and employees uh, part of the team um, and it it has to become one of our focus areas over the next several years because the number of projects that we have on both the, the largest projects on electric the largest projects on water but even the growth projects in district energy um, and some of the other areas of the organization are things that we have to be able to complete. Uh, Senate Bill 64 is gonna push us to have to have um, all of those projects completed by 2031. Um, and our goals that we set on the um, electric IRP have them set uh, to have to be completed by 2030. Um, and so it, it becomes a, a primary focus of the teams uh, to, to be able to execute on the project. And you're right, in the past, whenever we have uh, underspent what we budgeted, we use that money to pay down debt. Uh, and now we are using that money to uh, go in. We've been using that money and saving up for it over the last several years with rate stabilization funds on the electric side. Um, and we'll continue to do that as we move forward and be able to have dollars in place to be able to pay for future capital expansion. Bobby, I've got a question. Yep, the, Rick. The um, this projected budget, proposed budget, has a proposed sort of a mid-year rate increase, but that rate increase comes to us at a separate time. It does. Okay, we don't. This isn't automatic when we vote on this. No, we will have, uh, like we did this year. Um, we have moved, in general, we've moved our rate actions to April because there was a lot happening with rates and budgets and new year and all the things that happen if we try to do that in October. So we push that so that the April deadline separates that and gives us more time to be able to present that. We'll come back to you in January with some more information and I'm actually not sure which months, but fine. two months prior, we'll come back, have a public hearing. And like we have this time, we'll have a public hearing and then we'll ask for the vote on that the next meeting so that it we provide opportunity to consider what the public has to say about the rates. And Thank so, you, that's what yeah. I understood, but I just wanted to make sure. Yes, sir. I could have said yes, sir, but I got <laughs> into more detail. And two 
things that I think were takeaways, Joe, from the Finance Committee meeting that are important for this group. And one is the way we are going to look at our budget cycle in the future, that we're going to look at a, a longer horizon than just the one-year horizon. So we'll be able to benchmark against, I think, did you say five years, Lori, that we're going to try to three to five-year kind of budget? I think the O&M is a three-year business plan. The capital will have as a five-year. And then we also need longer-term projections on 10 years plus. So, and within within that, the O&M budget, um, I, this was my comment, so I'll, I'll own it, but I think we've done a great job with fuel, and I think we've done a great job with debt service, and, you know, the team has really done a, an amazing job um, on those two items, and I just think we, as a finance committee, needed a deeper dive into O&M expenses, because they've in, improved and increased significantly, not improved, but increased significantly, so the the team has agreed to come back to um, a future finance committee meeting to really do a deeper dive into um, the O&M cost. Thank you, Marty. The, the other comment I'll make, and I made it to, to Jay, is the Senate Bill 64, some of this spending, and I know Jay and his team are doing everything possible, but we should hopefully move those dates out um, to accomplish what they're asking for, which I think is, I, I think the bill is, is great in what it's trying to do, but I think it's trying to do it too quickly. So I reiterate to Jay and his team that we do everything we can to extend out those dates on Senate Bill 64. Yes, sir. With that, is there a motion to move this agenda item forward? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those against, the motion passes. Um, I think um, other business, including old and other new business open discussion. Um, the only added item I have, if there's nothing else, is I had a chance to talk to Tom Van Osdell, who now is a faith-based faith leader for the whole Ascension system, and his wife has now had a ministry in Indianapolis, so they have moved and moved quickly. But I think, you know, when John took this thing John Baker took this over when he did. It was a tough situation, and Tom was always the most centered person. So if you guys get a chance to thank him, I think it'd be appropriate. And Jay, if you get a chance to, um, you know, see if sometime in late fall we can do a dinner to thank Tom for all his work and efforts throughout his term as a board meeting, I think that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Bobby, can I say something? I wanted to uh, commend Jay uh, with the report uh, earlier on what we're doing in terms of our talent inventory. Um, I'm glad that, that we're continuing that effort um, and then wanted to also um, reiterate um, what we saw this morning with the uh, summer co-ops and colleges and universities. Uh, I, full disclosure, I have known uh, Raven for almost 30 years. Uh, we met each other uh, back at the University of Georgia uh, as junior high school uh, students. And so I'm delighted that she is a part of this team. She's a star uh, and she's been out on our campus, um, particularly as, as I know that we are wanting to do what we can to diversify our pipelines. And so I wanted to commend you, Jay, and, and you as well, David, and, and certainly uh, Raven, my uh, childhood friend uh, that I was blessed to see uh, here this morning. Didn't even know that she was... Uh, uh, going to be here this morning, but wanted to commend you and the team uh, for your work in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faison. and I'll reiterate that point. Yeah, Raven, your your talk was inspirational, and and Jay, what you and the team are doing is fantastic. Any other comments? With that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
Thank I'll you. do this. <laughs> Never understood why we had to have this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay